God. Those are such fitting words. Hallelujah. Uh, to command the praise of Yahweh. That is uh, truly what we desire. Because you're worthy. Uh, certainly to be rightly oriented toward you in worship is uh, beneficial to us. But the greater reason, the greater motivation this morning to praise you is simply because you're worthy. And so acknowledging that, God, I pray that we would be, uh, continue today to be faithful worshipers, uh, just as we've lifted up voices to you. God, we pray that uh, you would have the attention of our ears and that you would captivate our hearts as your word is opened. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. And please open up your Bibles to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. I'm going to just start by reading our passage for us. A mictum of David. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless Yahweh who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set set Yahweh continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand There are pleasures forever. By way of introducing this text, I want to pivot from Psalm 16 and have you turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 has been an incredibly encouraging portion of Scripture for one very simple reason, over the past almost three years now that we've been reading the Psalms in our corporate gathering, we're almost done. It's kind of sad to me. But over the past few years, I have found myself asking many times a question that appears in this chapter. Look at Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 32. This is Philip finding himself uh, perfectly positioned to encounter someone who otherwise would not hear the gospel from a teacher. And so Philip, this deacon, evangelist, is perfectly positioned by God to preach the gospel to this Ethiopian eunuch. He approaches the man's chariot, who just so happens to be reading from a scroll of Isaiah. And verse 32 records, 
Now, the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. That is Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And verse 34 here records the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? That question has been encouraging to me because I found myself asking the same question as I've prepared to read the Psalms for these, to- these years now, who's he talking about? Is, is this about him or somebody else? And so I'm comforted, I have been comforted to know I'm not the only one with that question. The fact that the, the eunuch, who's eager to believe God, eager to receive the gospel and have Christ preach to him, finds it difficult to discern the referent included in certain prophecies at times. He's not sure. That's not a commentary on the clarity of the scriptures. The scriptures are clear, but it is a commentary on the difficulty for us discerning at times what the scriptures are clearly communicating. Look at what happens next. Verse 35, what does Philip do? Knowing his Bible, knowing Christ. Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. We can clearly see, I mean, you can, you're probably familiar with this passage Uh, with Isaiah 53, and for us, it's a no-brainer, right? Come on. Of course it's Christ. He suffered, he died, four sins, was raised again. If that's clear to you, then praise God. It wasn't clear to everyone, although it was communicated clearly by God. But the question that the eunuch asks is totally appropriate in some passages of Scripture that are just difficult to discern. This uh, indicates not only the difficulty of discerning who these prophets might be referring to at times, but it's also an indication, indication of the clarity about Jesus in the Old Testament that the Old Testament clearly communicates Christ to the original hearers. Uh, Passages like Isaiah 53 clearly communicate that. And because of what follows, uh, the salvation of this eunuch, his baptism, this is also another indication, because Philip doesn't have any New Testament revelation to give him, This is a clear indication of the saving nature of the Old Testament to those who believe it. When the Old Testament is understood in all of its brilliance and clarity and truth and authority and embraced by the hearer, it is sufficient to save. One must see Christ and one must believe what is there. And so as I've read the Psalms and prepared to read them week after week and found myself asking that question, I've searched for answers. And this will take us uh, somewhat back to our passage in reference to Psalm 16. Of whom does the prophet say what we just read in Psalm 16? Let me give you uh, two answers or two uh, passages that answer the question as clearly as Philip did for the eunuch. Go to Acts chapter 2. 
In Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 13, we have two passages where the two most prominent apostles, being Peter in Acts 2 and Paul in Acts 13, answer that very question, of whom does the prophet say these things? Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22, and both of these uh, passages, Acts 2 and 13, are from a New Testament vantage point going to answer that question for us about Psalm 16 and just prepare us in a way to dive in. So Acts 2.22, Peter says, first sermon from the church, if you will, men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, Just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter says, after quoting our passage, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he, that is David, was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, He did what? He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured poured forth that which you are both see and hear. Who did Peter believe David was speaking of? He believed that David was speaking of Christ. Fast forward to Acts 13. We get another example, more of the same, but this time with the Apostle Paul. Paul preaching again to a large group of Jews, addressing them in verse 16 of Acts 13, as men of Israel. He says, jump down to verse 34, as for the fact that he, that is God, raised him, that is Jesus, up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, that is ours, 16, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and did what? Underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. These two prominent apostles clearly believed that reading David's words led them to the conclusion that they were speaking not of David, but David's descendants, uh, David's descendant, Christ. And they're right. David did write of Christ. 
And David did not write of Christ because they said he did. Right? You understand that? The Psalm 16 is not about Christ because the apostles believed it was. Peter and Paul had no more authority to make Psalm 16 about Christ than any of us do. They didn't write Psalm 16. The only persons who could make Psalm 16 be referring to Christ, who could determine the meaning of Psalm 16, are the authors of that psalm. Authors being God and David. And so turn back to Psalm 16, and as we walk through Psalm 16, I hope that it'll be clear why this psalm is only and entirely about David's descendant, Christ. This psalm is exclusively about him and gloriously so. David in this psalm gives Christ words in the first person. That's why you see the first person pronouns throughout. I, verse 1, take refuge in you. I said, verse 2, I have no good, etc. These are first person pronouns from the pit of David, but not for David. David, uh, some have wondered why this is, if, if this is so much about Christ, then you could read commentary after commentary and watch uh, theologians wrestle with this issue because the psalm can be read sounding like David's talking about himself. And that wouldn't be completely unwarranted, right? I mean, he uses first-person pronouns. We have the title, a mictum of David, that probably being a, a liturgical term, but it's from the pen of David. And so if you assume that it, this is writing, uh, David's writing about himself, that wouldn't be a completely unfair assumption. Even the characteristics of this first-person character, the, the I, the person uh, being referenced, sounds like it could be David. Pr this person expresses trust in God. He prays similar prayers that we find David praying in other portions of Scripture. Uh, he delights in God's people. He despises idolaters. Um, it sounds very much like David. I think that is a, there's a simple explanation for why this sounds so much like David. This sounds so much like David because David was so much like Christ. Uh, and David was so much like Christ because he got to write these kinds of psalms. He got to write firsthand about who Christ would be, what Christ would be like, the very words that Christ would eventually say after his incarnation one day. And so having the benefit of writing these things beforehand, then he gets, to, he gets the privilege of modeling the very things of which he wrote. And so David, no wonder, looks like Christ. This psalm would have been sung in Israel time and time again for centuries. And it would have provided instruction, not only for David when he wrote it, not only for his generation, but this would have provided abiding instruction for subsequent generations of God's people, just like it does for us. And so, like David, they would have also received instruction from this psalm. And because it is so clearly a prophecy about Christ, they would have, like David, been able to model what the Savior exhibits and exemplifies in this very psalm. This will do the same for us this morning. Look back at Psalm verse 1, chapter 16, or Psalm 16. After the title, a victim of David, 
the psalm opens in a prayer of desperation. A prayer of desperation, a simple request, preserve me. Preserve me. This is indication that the life of the speaker is hanging in the balance. A a prayer like this for preservation indicates that the speaker is in imminent danger. And so everything else unfolds from that one request to be preserved, that the life of this one would be kept, would be protected by God himself. What you will not find in this psalm is any sort of lament. You would expect someone who is facing imminent suffering, impending danger, to be crying out about his enemies, lamenting the situation he's in. We find that in other psalms. That's not what we find here. And it is because the suffering in view is not the ultimate focus of the Messiah who speaks these words, but it's something more something beyond the sufferings, and that'll be made clear by the end of the psalm. The purpose of this psalm, the point of this psalm, can be captured this way. In the face of imminent suffering, Christ set his heart on four objectives. In the face of imminent suffering, Christ set his heart on four objectives. The first one of those objectives that Christ set his focus resolutely on is a continual confidence in God. A continual confidence in God. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. Christ here sets his heart on the first objective, uh, a continual confidence in God in a couple of different ways. First, as his refuge, his continual confidence in God is evident because he has made God his refuge. He says this, I take refuge in you. This is characteristically, and even now, I do this. I take refuge in you. Like a fortress where I can find protection, where I can seek safety, I go to you, God, that, is, that was true of Christ. How did Christ take refuge in God? Well, he took refuge in God the same way other saints of old. Any faithful believer takes refuge in God by trusting his word and by trusting his character. That is how you can take refuge in God by trusting God's word and trusting God's character. David, just a few psalms later, a couple psalms later, says this very thing, includes this uh, same language. When David is delivered from his own enemies, in Psalm 18, he calls God or uh, says that he takes refuge in God. Psalm 18, verse 2, Yahweh is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He just compounds the protection words here. And he says that what he does is take refuge in God. In verse 30 of the same psalm, 
As for God, his way is blameless. The word of Yahweh is tried. He is a shield to all those who take refuge in him. This being a, an explanation of where those, find, where those people who take refuge find it in the tried and true word of God. That very verse is repeated again in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. The way to take refuge in God is by trusting his word that cannot be proven untrue. It proves true. When it's tried, it demonstrates itself to be trustworthy. And so taking refuge in God means retreating to his word as the trustworthy source of all reality. Also, taking refuge in God, since it includes taking refuge in God's word, also requires trusting uh, his character, trusting God's word and trusting God's character. Got a helpful reference to this very practice in Zephaniah chapter 3, where these two ideas are married refuge, taking refuge in God, and in his name, because there, this prophet looking forward gives uh, or records. God's words firsthand, saying this in verse 12, Zephaniah 3, 12. But I will leave among you, Israel, a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in, not God, not God's word, but they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. That means taking refuge in his character, in his reputation, and who God has revealed himself to be. That's what it means to take refuge in his name. That's what the name signifies, to run to his character as trustworthy. So David, in Psalm 16, records that Christ does this. This is how we know that he is taking continual confidence in God as his refuge. Also, verse 2, this continual confidence that the Messiah has in God is not only as his refuge, but as his Lord. Look at verse 2. I said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. I said to Yahweh, you are my Lord, or uh, literally, you said to Yahweh, he's speaking to his own soul, which is why some translations record my soul said to Yahweh. When he says you said, he's speaking to himself, you are my Lord. And this is a comfort to Christ as he faces imminent suffering that he has taken refuge in God, that he has and still does regard God as his Lord. The Lord Jesus regarded God as his Lord. So much so that he could say of his own soul, you have said of God, soul, you are my Lord. This is typical of servants, people who view themselves as slaves to another, that they would look to another as their master. Psalm 123 says this, To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of slaves, servants, look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to Yahweh, our God, until he is gracious to us. 
servants of Yahweh looked to him as their Lord, and Christ was the preeminent slave of God. <laughs> he submitted himself, Philippians 2 says, as a slave taking on the form of a slave when he became incarnate. This language should not be uh, strange to our New Testament ears to think of one member of the Trinity, God the Son, uh, regarding another member of the Trinity, God the Father, as Lord or as God. The New Testament records the same language, includes the same quotations. Um, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 says this, But of the Son, God says, this is God the Father speaking, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom, you, still speaking of the Son, have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions, the Father says. God the Father tells God the Son, calling him God, you have a God. God, your God. <laughs> And so here's another instance of that where one member of the Trinity regards the, uh, gives regard to the lordship deity of another member of the Trinity. Christ here says to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. All of the good that Christ had, he considered wrapped up in who God is. There was nothing good that Christ could have or knew of apart from God. And so he looks to him as his Lord, which is why he has this continual confidence in God the Father. The second objective, the second way in which uh, objective that Christ set his heart to in the face of his imminent suffering is number two, an affectionate association with God's people. This was a comfort to him as he faced suffering, as he considered going to the cross. He called this to mind. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Verse 3 demonstrates this affectionate association with God's people in the very fact that he delights in the saints. As for the saints, that is the holy ones, they who are in the earth, or as it could be translated, in the land, I think that's a more fitting for the context even, as he looks ahead, they are the noble ones, the majestic ones, in whom is all my delight. Christ going to the cross for this same group of people anticipates union with them, being amongst them, and roots, he says, all his delight in them. Now notice, all his delight is in the saints, but he just said in verse 2, he has no good apart from God. How are both of those things true? No good apart from you, but I find all my pleasure in the saints. Those two statements can only be true at the same time if the saints are not apart from God. The good that he finds only in God, he can say his delight is in the saints because that same group of majestic ones are united with God. And so the delight in them, while he finds no good apart from God, is no contradiction whatsoever. In fact, anyone who has a continual confidence in God, as we've already seen in the first couple of verses, will also find themselves delighting 
like Christ in the saints. Do you enjoy being around Christians? If you trust God, you will. You will love the fellowship of the saints. Christ does both strong confidence in God, all delight in the saints. If we're like Christ, we'll find ourselves laying hold of both of these realities. And so Christ here longs for close association, a close acquaintance with God's holy ones. By contrast, he does not desire any association with another group, that group being in verse 4. Look at verse 4. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. He says, I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. He's got delight in one direction, the saints. By contrast, those who don't share his delight are those who practice idolatry. Those who have bartered, some translations say hasten after, gone after, another god. These are people who, at great cost even, choose to practice idolatry. Their sorrows will be multiplied. Uh, that is true in two ways, <laughs> temporally and eternally. The sorrows of those who go after another God will be multiplied into eternity forever and ever. Those who do not repent of idolatry will find themselves forever under the infinite wrath of God so that after billions of years have passed, they are no closer to finishing seeing the end of God's wrath as when they started. Their sorrows will only and forever be multiplied. This is also true in the here and now. Those who pursue idolatry and refuse to let go of idolatrous uh, desires, motivations, you only increase your sorrow in this life doing that. You were unhappy as an unbeliever. I'm a firm believer that gay is a terrible euphemism for homosexuality. It is, it is not a happy, blessed state of life to exist to insist on uh, defying God's created order, what God says is upright in the realm of sexuality. They are not happy people, generally speaking. And if they are happy for some time, that won't last long. When what the idolatry of perverted sexual fulfillment is promising does not come to pass. Sorrows will be increased, which is why we should be waiting with an answer when their unhappiness finally proves itself. The Christian can say, we have answers. We have hope for you. That final statement in verse 4, I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. Uh, can be taken in, in one of a couple ways. It either means Christ is not participating in idolatrous practices himself, the drink offerings of blood or the taking of the false names or the false God's names upon his lips. He's not doing those things. Uh, it was forbidden in Exodus twenty three thirteen, for example, to take uh, the names of false gods on the lips of God's people. They were not to swear by them. They were not to uh, profess them and swear allegiance to them. I think the, the better way, though, to, to take that statement 
is that Jesus the, is not actually interceding, playing the role of mediator for those idolaters, which means that the reference there, the pouring out their drink offerings, nor taking their names upon my lips, the there is a reference to the idolaters themselves, not the, the gods that they worship. I think the, the context is more suited for this interpretation, which uh, I think proves itself in the, next, in the next verse. But to just think about this affectionate association with God's people, these verses, the just highlight that God, that Christ here is eager for the saints. He delights over the saints, in the saints, specifically as their priest and mediator. Uh, not the mediator and not the priest for idolaters, but only for the so-called majestic ones. He is the priest of the saints. He is currently mediating at the right hand of God for every believer. And so it's a contrast uh, between his delight being in the saints and not in idolaters. He interceding delightfully so for the saints, not for idolaters. And so as he goes to the cross and anticipates, uh, finds himself facing imminent suffering, he is setting his heart on these things, a continual confidence in God, an affectionate association with God's people, and even, number three, a superior allotment from God. A superior allotment from God. This is what verses five and six are communicating His allotments from God really come down to two things, God himself and land in Israel. We'll take those one at a time. God himself, Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. What's going on here? What is he he referencing? This is priestly language. This is priestly language. Yahweh being the portion of my inheritance and my cup, uh, what I've been allotted, what I have given to me. He says, all that I have given to me, similar to the statement of not finding any good uh, besides you, my cup, my portion is God himself. This is priestly language because this is exactly what was told to the priests. Turn to Numbers chapter 18. And we can see this language uh, here. Numbers 18 verse 20. You'll remember that in uh, number 16, this rebellion of Korah, right? The people have refused to go into the promised land in uh, just a few chapters prior in Numbers 13. They've persisted in even greater rebellion uh, in the chapters that follow. And then by chapter 16, Korah has said, we want the priesthood. All God's people are equally holy and deserve uh, to be able to be mediators between God and the people. So these other Levites wanted what was only given to Aaron's uh, line, the the priesthood. And in chapter 18, verse 20, God, following that rebellion in number 16, has taken it upon himself for the sake of Moses, Aaron, and the people to really solidify, fortify Aaron's particular role as priest. It's unique. That's why the rod buds in chapter 17, and then he gives particular words for Aaron's line. Look at what he says in uh, verse 20 of Numbers 18. Then Yahweh said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land, nor own any portion among them. 
I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. And so you will find everywhere you look, when the land gets apportioned, the tribe of Levi doesn't get any. That's why you end up with uh, 12 tribes, but really 13. 12 tribes get land. And Levi gets divided up among the, the tribes. They don't get land. They, their inheritance is Yahweh himself because they have the honor and privilege of serving in temple worship or tabernacle worship. That same statement is, is repeated in Deuteronomy 10 verses 8 and 9. As Moses sends the people into the land, he reminds them Levi does not get an inheritance. He does not get a portion because Yahweh is both his portion, and his inheritance. Here, Christ says the same thing. Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. And so he considers that God is enough for him to not have a lot in what the rest of the common people got is A-OK. But it doesn't stop there. He says, you support my lot, meaning you determine for me what I have. Verse 6, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. What's going on there? We just read that he doesn't have a place, an inheritance, a region, because he says Yahweh is his portion of his inheritance. He's all he needs, making this statement like priests. Well, in this, even though he made Yahweh his portion, he considered Yahweh his portion, his inheritance, this priest does receive land, which is the reference to lines. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. He knows that he has more coming. This is Christ again looking forward into the future at, uh, at or forward to a future day. You can write down uh, Proverbs twenty two twenty eight. Maybe you've come across this in your reading and you just kept reading because you didn't know what was going on. Do not move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. And moving on. <laughs> Apparently that's a, a wisdom principle. If you understand the context that these words are written in, the significant of, significance of the land promises, then this makes a lot of sense. How significant were the boundaries, the ancient landmarks that your fathers have said by the time Solomon's writing these words. The landmarks are ancient. The uh, boundaries have already been established. And so every tribe had gotten a portion. And within that, families had gotten a portion of what their tribe had been allotted. That was incredibly significant. That's why Naboth won't sell the king of Israel, Ahab, his vineyard, his land to make a vineyard, to make a, a vegetable garden of it. Why? Because Naboth's a God-fearing man who won't violate that passage, even for the king of Israel. In Joshua, we think of Joshua, the book of Joshua, as the book of the conquest that records the conquest of Israel, and that's true enough. But only five or six chapters are devoted to the actual battles. Far more chapters in Joshua, upwards of 10, are devoted to talking about the land being apportioned. It was significant what tribes got what portions of the land that mattered in God's plan for them. And if you fast forward, this will be a fascinating study at some point, maybe for an equipping hour or an evening service. The significance of the land promises just traced throughout all of Scripture. What's coming, if you read 
uh, Ezekiel 45 and 48 is someone, some figure called the prince gets land. No priests got land. And one day, the one who will rule over Israel in new land divisions with a new rebuilt temple that has massive uh, dimensions, the, the plot of land that the temple will sit on would be the 51st or 52nd largest country if it was uh, on earth today. All of that is reshaped in the kingdom that is coming. And so here, David in Psalm 16 prophesies about that time when this one, his own seed, who has Yahweh as his portion, will also have lines fall to him in pleasant places. And he considers that suitable, perfect, beautiful. So this one, David's own seed, as a priest, gets God, and like the people, gets land. Completely unique. Christ found comfort in these words as he went to suffer. That he has and does take continual confidence in God. He anticipates and his affectionate association with God's people, and he anticipates a superior allotment from God, God himself and land in Israel. And then finally, the final objective that Christ set his heart on in the face of imminent suffering is this, a bold trust in God. A bold trust in God. This unfolds simply and rapidly, how this trust in God is seen. He says, verse 7, just declares, I will bless Yahweh who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. He blesses God in the face of suffering. His worship here is unwavering. And when he says Yahweh has counseled him, he's recalling when or the fact that he has been taught by God. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature or in favor with God and men. Right? Jesus in his earthly life grew in his knowledge of God, was instructed by God. The one who is omniscient veiled those attributes so that he could, like a man, learn. And he was taught by God, instructed by God. He says, indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. What's going on there? God has taught him and he teaches himself. Well, he teaches himself what God has taught him. Even the verb forms in the Hebrew just demonstrate that what God has simply said, he boldly declares. uh, These verbs, counseled and instructs. Yahweh has counseled me, my mind instructs me. Counseled appears in in, uh, what's called the cal stem, just means it's a simple way of saying something. And then the my mind instructs me, instructs appears in the pl uh, stem just means it's an intensified, intensified way of saying what could have been said in the cow stem. The implication to take from that is God, what God simply says, he then boldly echoes. And that should be the testimony of everyone who trusts in God. What God simply says in his word, we take it to heart so that our hearts boldly, eagerly, zealously echo God's simple truth. And Christ models that here for us. He's counseled by God so that even his own inner being can instruct him 
in the night. Verse 8, his bold trust in God is not only for counsel, but also for help. I have set Yahweh continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. He looks to God as his helper. Helper. He has set Yahweh continually before him so that he is always mindful of God, more mindful of God than the danger, more mindful of God than his enemies, more mindful of God than his disciples who would have abandoned him. He is mindful of God. He is living to please him and him alone. And it is because he is boldly looking to him for help. That's what it means to have him at my right hand as a protector, as a guard. He's the one who's helping him. For that reason, he will not be shaken. That same verb was used in uh, the previous psalm, uh, Psalm 15, verse 5, which says, He who does not put out his money at interest, nor does not, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. You have a description of the righteous man who will one day inherit the kingdom, who will dwell on the holy hill, referenced in verse 1, who has rights to abide in God's tent even in the present day. The one who fits that description, verses 2 to 5, he who does these things will never be shaken, cannot be disturbed, will not decay, will continually flourish forever. That's what it means to not be shaken. He will find himself one day unshaken in God's holy hill. That's how one commentator uh, describes what's in view with that, that word. A man of the foregoing character shall never so fall into decay as not to flourish in eternal youth. Never be so shaken as to lose his steadfastness. Never so slip as not to recover himself. Never so slide as to rise no more. Never be moved from the Mount Zion above. Eternity itself shall see no ruin nor overthrow come on this man. That same thing is true of Christ, that he would not be shaken, he would not be moved, he would not be ruined because he kept Christ, he kept the Lord, Yahweh, continually before him at his right hand. He looked to him for help. And then finally, his bold trust in God is demonstrated in that he looked to God for life. He looked to God for life, even life beyond the grave. Verse 10, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or the grave, or as the New Testament has it, Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Christ knew as he went to suffer that it wouldn't be long before he was raised to life. His prayer in verse 1 to be preserved would be answered. He would be preserved so much so that his body would not even decay, which requires that he not be in the grave beyond three days. Day four would have been in the Jews' mind permanent decay. You see that in John 11 with Lazarus. He's been dead four days. So he had already started decaying. This necessitates a resurrection before that time in no more than three days. And he is the Holy One, my soul, your Holy One, a reference to 
the same individual. He would not undergo decay. The New Testament marks that David did undergo decay. This isn't about David. He had made known to him the path of life. He entered into God's presence where there was fullness of joy and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high forever. This is where Christ is currently, a resurrected Messiah. If you trust Christ, believer, then these words were recorded for your encouragement. The one who mediates for you, the one who suffered in your place, was raised to life. You have an alive and well mediator. Your priest is alive and well today. And so we should have boldness in trusting Christ the same way that Christ entrusted himself to God the Father. You ever thought about the Psalms uh, not being intended primarily to be read or preached but sung? Was Christ waiting to be crucified and singing this song that he had learned where his father David in the human sense, the, his slave, he was David's own Lord, recorded these words for him to sing as he went to the cross? This would have been an easy way for Christ to recall these truths and establish his heart further to courageously, boldly endure the wrath of God. And these are instructive for us as they were for, for previous generations to model, to imitate the Savior that we see recorded here, to have a continual confidence in God, to anticipate affectionate association with God's people, to anticipate this allotment even that we'll receive one day in the land where the kingdom will be one day and to take a bold trust in God. This psalm is so instructive for us. We should sing this psalm. We should memorize this psalm. We should counsel this psalm to one another. We should preach this psalm. We should talk of this psalm, read of this psalm often for our own soul's sake. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. We would not have thought to write these things. We would have had no starting point for recording these truths unless you tell us what Christ would have said and did say, we would be completely in the dark and have no idea. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ's eagerness to be associated with us. I pray that we would be as unashamed of him as he is of us and be eager to make his name famous wherever we are, all for your glory. Amen.